Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for purchasing the IPO webinar and uh, attending this uh, Introduction to Trading Trends webinar here. We're going to cover the basics today, but you would be surprised how important it is to sometimes come back to the basics. And a lot of what I'm showing you here is actually really not that basic. So we're going to compress a lot of material down into a very short period of time. And by the end of this presentation, you should have a pretty good idea of how the methodology works, both good and bad. Now, there's a display on the screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. And the short version is all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I think most everyone here knows me. There are a few new faces. Um, I'm not going to bore you and go through all this. You can get a bio off my website. I've been doing this for about 20 years, and I've written three books that have uh, been published in seven different languages total. And what else is going on I want to tell you? I think that's enough. Now, if you're like me, you'd probably be more interested in the methodology than me. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I've talked about it many times before, but there's a couple things I want to harp on. Uh, it's not my way or the highway. There's a lot of ways to trade. There's some ways that I'm not a big fan of. But if you use that methodology and you're successful with that methodology, then by all means, use that methodology. But if you can take something that I do and make your stuff better, that's, that's even better. That's great, okay? So you don't have to follow everything I say, obviously. It's not my way or the highway. But if you could take something a la carte from me and make your trading better, that's fantastic. Not a get-rich-quick uh, scheme. There will be losses, but... You win by surviving the bad times relatively unscathed. And I use the word relatively unscathed. There will be some drawdowns. There will be some losses. But you do great in the good times. And you catch a few winners here and there. And that makes it all worthwhile. And that's trend following 101, by the way. There is a repeatability in what I do. And every time I talk about this, I realize it's more and more and more and more important to talk about it. Um, you don't have to, just a regular generic brokerage will work. You don't need some high-end brokerage where you have to get the execution down to the penny or some offshore account in uh, Nigeria where they'll allow you to do some things that are pretty much illegal in the United States. Um, it's not that crucial you could be I hate to use the word sloppy but you could be a little sloppy with your entries I know some day traders that are in and out all day long you try to follow them it will become an exercise in futility you would be getting in right as they're getting out and your execution is going to be so crucial if you're off by a penny or two then you're not going to succeed and again I don't want to dig myself a hole and pick a fight with any of these people because some of these people are successful and what they do, but the repeatability of it for the average Joe out there is very difficult, okay? I always get asked, by the way, does it work in all markets? Yes. Does it work in all time frames? Yes. But there is an efficiency issue, which we're going to talk about a little bit tomorrow in the IPO webinar. There's an efficiency issue where more efficient markets, it doesn't work as well, you have to pick your spots more carefully. For instance, if you're going to do Forex, you want to trade only off of major, major lows. And if you look at like the or commodities or something, if you look at like the, the webinar I did just yesterday, in fact, it's on my website under free videos if you want to look at it when you get a chance. I talked about a major low in coffee uh, off with a bow tie. Okay, so if all you did was trade those transitions off of major lows, so you have to pick your spots a lot more carefully in efficient markets. Efficient markets are markets that are well analyzed and well traded by a lot of people. Forex, okay, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and say, wow, there's this thing called Forex and I'm going to start trading. Well, you might be aware of it, but trust me, there's trillions of dollars being swapped around in that, and there's a lot of people fighting it out. Uh, that's the beauty of the IPOs. They're unbelievably inefficient. And, again, we're going to get into that in a lot more detail tomorrow. It can be hard work, but for me it's a lot of fun. Uh, the general, the core methodology, which we're going to work on today, 
I like to look at a couple thousand charts every night. For me, it's like being on a treasure hunt. I get a big cup of coffee, and it's a lot of fun. And the goal is to minimize losses and allow for the occasional home runs. And that outlier or those home runs are very important, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now, I'm going to go way back to the most basic of basics. But guess what? This is so important because people confuse the issue with facts so many times, okay, so much, so often. The question is, what is a stock? And here we have a little piece of paper for Big Dave Corporation, okay? This is 100 shares. Okay, so what is a stock? A stock is a piece of paper. Well, it used to be a piece of paper. Now it's an electronic blip in your account. But a stock is a piece of paper, or used to be a piece of paper, that represents ownership in a company. Okay, you own a little piece of that company as represented by the paper. Now, what is a company? Okay, well, a company is a person, partnership, or corporation engaged in commerce, manufacturing, or service. It is a profit-seeking enterprise or concern based on, that's what dictionary.com says. Now, again, a stock is a piece of paper representing ownership in a company, okay? I've got some stock certificates on my wall. I bought a whole bunch of them. They're cheap, and they make for great decorations, by the way. And I take the prettier ones, the one with the pretty ladies and, and some pretty gentlemen. <laughs> More pretty ladies and gentlemen, though, or interesting graphics or interesting companies like Studebaker because I, like, um, I like cars, so I've got Studebaker stock and just a variety of different um, and quirky companies and all. I've got them on, on the walls uh, of my office, uh, on one wall at least. So that's a piece of paper uh, representing ownership in a company. Now, a company is an entity looking to prosper through commerce and those other things that I said earlier. Now, here's the clincher. And I know you guys' eyes are ro rolling over right now or glazing over. But you're going to be surprised how many people confuse this concept. A company is not a stock, okay? And a stock is not a company. But people get that confused, okay? They're, a company might be doing great things and going great places. But if the stock price doesn't reflect that, then you shouldn't be in that stock. A stock, a company might be selling some promise, and they might not materialize. But if the stock is going up, that's a good thing, and that's the promise of the future. And that's what makes the IPOs work so great. They're a bit of a technician's dream because they often go up in spite of what the company may or may not be doing. So don't confuse the two things, okay? Just because you like your iPhone, don't run out and buy Apple. So why does a stock exist for you? Okay, Not for a company. Uh, for a company, a stock exists so they can monetize the company's currency. It's one way of looking at it. Um, people come public maybe to get... Uh, to pay off their employees, to maybe pay down some debt, to maybe get some money in to create a cure for drugs, to expand their burrito business or whatever. But why does a stock exist for you? A stock only exists for you for one reason, and never, ever forget it. The only reason a stock exists from your perspective is for you to make money. Why would you ever buy a stock unless you intended to make money on that stock, okay? So don't confuse the issue with facts. A stock is a stock. A company is a company. Now, why technical analysis? Well, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to fundamental analysis. A company can have great earnings for years and years and years and years, and the company can actually go down. Why? Well, probably, and this is just a guess, but probably because those earnings were discounted, meaning that 
the excitement of those future earnings was discounted in the market, so the stock price ran up in anticipation of that. And then the reality over the next one, two, three, four, five, even ten years of good earnings could have already been priced in the stock. So keep in mind that the stock and the price of the stock is a much different thing than the company. So why technical analysis? Well, here's the beauty of technical analysis. There's a hard and fast rule when it comes to charts. There's a hard and fast rule with technical analysis. And I'm going to use those two words, intertwine, or um, what, what, what am I looking for? <laughs> I'm going to use those, uh, I'm going to interchange those two words, charts and technical analysis. But here's the thing. There's only one hard and fast rule when it comes to technical. I'm sorry, there's only one rule that's a concrete rule that you cannot dispute. You can dispute any rules in fundamentals. You can't say that if earnings go up 20% a quarter, quarter, the stock will go up guaranteed. There are no such guarantees. But a technical analysis, if a stock should go from A to C, and C is greater than A, and B is greater than A, it's going to have to, and C is greater than B, it's going to have to have to pass through B on its way to C. So if it's at $5 a share and it's going to $20 a share, well, guess what? It's going to have to pass through B along the way. Now, it's not quite as simple as buy at B, although in IPOs it might be. And tomorrow I'm going to show you what I call the buy at B pattern, not to tease you or anything, but I think that's, that's important to know that a market is going to have to pass through B if it's going to C, okay? And, well, we'll get into that tomorrow. So now we know that the reason we use technical analysis is that market's going to have to go through a higher price if it's going to an even higher price or a lower price if it's going to even lower prices for shorts. So the question is, why do you want a trend follower? Well, even if you're a contra trend player, you have to be a trend follower for at least some length of time. Otherwise, you would not get paid. So my point is, why not be a trend follower all the time? So if you buy a market at A, in order to profit, another big duh, you have to sell higher than you buy. So if you sell it at B, well, your profit is going to be B minus A. And then from A to B is a trend, okay? So you have to capture a trend. If you're going to have a successful trade, you have to, you must capture a trend. If you sell short, your profit's going to be A minus B, and A to B, as you can see, is a trend. Okay. Now, I have a very simple approach. As you can see from the following chart, it's pretty easy. Okay, that's a joke. <laughs> Now, I keep things very simple, but the reason I'm showing you this, other than to hopefully uh, interject a slight amount of humor into this presentation, is that I get charts that look like this all the time, and people ask me my opinion, and it's like, well, is there an actual price chart underneath all this? Because I certainly can't see one. I think there's, I think I see something that looks like a bar. Maybe wait right there. I see something, but... People end up with analysis paralysis, and this is not what technical analysis is from my standpoint. Technical analysis is closer to that ABC chart or figure we looked at a minute ago. Now, the reason I show you that is because people overcomplicate things, and I do a whole presentation on this, and I've done it in the past. You can probably find it um, somewhere on my website or, or I've done it for other people, but uh, if you have trouble finding it, let me know. It's definitely in the flash drives where... You, we all start with a blank chart. We get our chart, charting packages, provided there's no templates already set up for us, and we just start with a blank chart, and we start adding these indicators. And we tend to add more and more indicators, and we reach a point in our journey where we start studying the complex and the arcane, okay? We start maybe counting waves, um, counting. There's some number counting methods out there. There's some arcane stuff, okay? Some numerology, okay? And then at some point, this 
enlightenment begins to happen, this understanding. And this is not unlike any Eastern philosophy. There's a lot of Eastern philosophies that talk about how when you reach the beginning, you've come to true enlightenment. And it's very much true in a trading world. Once you start peeling away all of that fluff and you get back to the blank chart is when true enlightenment, at least for many, begins to happen. Okay? So, all kidding aside, my approach is a very simple one. One should not increase beyond what is necessary, the number of entities required to explain anything. And I think Einstein has a very similar quote where it's things should not be as simple as possible, but then no further. But basically, I think he's saying something very similar to Occam's razor. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci said it the best, I think, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Okay. And a lot of people think just because it's simple, it doesn't work. Uh, I know people that uh, have these very complex methodologies, and they tend to be seen as a guru because they because nobody can figure out what they're doing because it's so complex, and then they have this mystique about them. But my stuff is very simple. Somebody was asking me a couple of days ago, "What's what's your average client?" It's like, well, I've got PhDs, I've got kids in high school. It's like I've got a a, a mix of both and uh, some college kids too. Um, should you trade for short-term or longer-term gains? Well, here's the thing. No matter what anyone tells you, especially if they're screaming and hollering on TV, you can only predict the short-term when it comes to market. It's sort of like uh, predicting the weather. If it's cloudy and thundering outside, I know, and getting kind of dark, I know it's going to rain fairly soon, but I don't know if it's going to be raining this time next week or next year or 10 years from now. Well, Trading is no different. As I said early on, kind of setting a few things up here, all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So in spite of what anyone tells you, you can only predict the short term. The great thing about the short term is your risks are better defined. Something bad can't really happen in general, or something bad doesn't happen over a short period of time. I mean, it can, okay, and that's one of the dangers of day trading. Something bad still can happen. But you're less likely to have something bad happen to you if you're only in the market for a short period of time. Unfortunately, you just don't make enough money. The real money is in the longer-term trends. So let's talk about longer-term trading. Well, that's what the money is. Unfortunately, the longer you forecast, the less accurate you will be. And then you're going to have big losses and big drawdowns. We all read about these famous traders who make all this money. But what they often fail to tell you is that they subsequently blow up by taking on too much risk, trying to capture longer-term trends. Your accuracy is going to be very low. Um, I hate to get into statistics because statistics is all worthless. 73.2% of people know that, okay? But when I did a lot of mechanical testing years ago, which helped me to become a discretionary trader, uh, you're going to be right about 28% in capturing those longer-term trends. So you're going to be right, I'm sorry, you could be wrong, roughly three quarters of the time. So what do, what's to do? It's a bit of a dilemma. Should you trade for short term or longer term gains? And the answer is yes. Why not trade for a small quick gain but be willing to stick with the position as long as it moves in your favor? This is a dated example but it's one of my favorites. It's a position that's set up really nice uh, 2009 after the bottom. Had a really good trend here, a little pullback. By the way, this is the same chart I showed earlier with all that fluff on it. And this thing, we were able to ride out a pretty decent trend in here for a couple of years. And, but we took partial profits within a few weeks right back here. It just took a little bit off. And the reason you take a little bit off is because, again, you can only predict with any degree of accuracy the short term. When I got in this trade, I'm like, this thing looks pretty good. But did I know it would go a couple of years? No, I did not. So... You could only predict the short term, but you could use a trailing stop, which I'll show you in a lot more detail in a few minutes, to keep you in that position for a long, long time. This one triggered right around here, and we got a nice little pop out of it within a well, – might have triggered a little bit over here, but within a few weeks, we got a nice little pop out of it. Better than poking now. I think it's about a 30% move. And then through trailing stops, you're able to ride out 
the longer term trend. And that's where the real money is. Okay. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, we had a nice little accelerating trend, which I'm going to talk about in a minute or so. Had a nice little pop the first day, but it didn't do a whole lot. But eventually, it began to run. So you take some partial profits. I think we took profits right around here because we don't know. This is the big unknown, okay? And our trailing stop is going to keep us in the position, hopefully, for a long, long time. And hopefully, that trend goes a long, long ways. Now, how do you predict the short term? Well, reversion to the mean is a fancy way of saying that, um, let's say you have an average. It's how much something moves around the average, okay? Mean is interchangeable. That's the word I was looking for earlier, interchangeable, with the word average when it comes to statistics. And imagine a dog on the sidewalk, and I'm not sure where I first heard this analogy. It seems like it's been around forever, but... Um, if somebody knows where that comes from or a book, I'll give them credit because I don't want to not give credit. But anyway, you got a dog that kind of, let's say you walk on a dog, and it gets to one edge of the sidewalk, that little tug and the leash, okay, when it gets tight, it tends to meander back and forth. So that's a good way of illustrating reversion to the mean. Unfortunately, the real path, if any, to anyone who's ever do walked a dog, is going to be a lot more erratic than this perfect little sine wave. So ideally, it's going to look like a little sine wave. And if it did, all you'd have to do is buy it over sold and sell it over bought. Unfortunately, every night I did that, metaphorically, that leash breaks, markets get a little out of control and take off. Sometimes they stall well short of over uh, sold or over bought. So that ride could be a lot more bumpier. So ideally you want to be buying into a market that's oversold or selling a market that's overbought, but you want to combine the longer term trend with that. So if you've got a solid uptrend in place, okay, and then that market becomes oversold, you know there's a pretty good chance it's going to pop back to overbought. And that's the basis of the methodology. We're trading reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend. I'm not a big fan of reversion to the mean trading in and of itself because those people will tell you, well, if a market drops 10%, you should buy it. What if it drops 15%? Well, you should buy even more. What if it drops 20%? Well, you should buy even more because eventually it's going to come back. It's going to bounce. Well, eventually it doesn't always happen. And a true reversion to the mean player does not use stops because they're looking to play that bounce. But I think if you did play reversion to the mean, you would definitely have to have stops. Otherwise, you'd have a very brilliant but brief career. Every now and then, we'll get into a choppy market. The reversion to the mean guys will, will float up or whatever you want to call it. Come out the woodwork. Float up would be a good way to put it, I guess. <laughs> And they look like geniuses, and then the market has a big spike down or accelerates higher, whatever the case may be, and it flushes them out of the system, okay? So a very dangerous way to trade. But if you are trading with the direction of the longer-term downtrend, and then you look to play that reversion to the bean move when the market becomes overbought for a downtrend, and you sell short, there's a pretty good chance provided that you did really good stock picking and the market's in your favor, overall market ideally in your favor, meaning going the same direction as your trade, sector moving the same direction as your trade. You've picked the best of the best setups, which we'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. Then there's a good chance that you're going to capture that reversion to the mean move in the direction of the overall trend, meaning that pullback's going to rally at least initially, okay? So this move is fairly certain, and recently we've been in a drawdown, and it's been pretty tough, okay? So it's, it's not a given. I don't want to make it sound like it's a given, but earlier in the year when the market was really trending, it's like we had 9 out of 9 or 10 out of 9 or 9 out of 10, some ridiculous number where all the trades were working. Lately, not a whole lot of trades have been working out just so well. So it's fairly certain, but of course there's no guarantee.
but it's fairly certain that you can get a reversion to the mean move in, in the direction of the trend. And this is certainly a lot more plausible than this. This has become really uncertain. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. But this is where the money is. If you could get a little profit here and then hang out just in case this materializes, you're going to do fantastic longer term. So here's the entire methodology in a nutshell. We want to first look for a strong trend, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. We're looking for a correction in that trend, a pullback, okay? And then we're looking to enter if and only if that position triggers. So if the market rallies and then dies out like this, we avoid a trade. By using a fairly liberal entry, one of my mistakes in, in the first book, because it was written, I got a little too um, egotistical, I guess. Um, I made it look like you could put that entry right above that high, okay? And I guess I probably have it drawn in a little too close right here, like you just entered right above this high. Uh, in reality, you want to give that a little room. That's lesson 102. But you want to give it a little bit of room just to avoid a false start. Nowadays, there's a lot of, um, I want to stop short of saying manipulation, but for lack of a better word, there's a little manipulation that seems to occur, and which can push these markets. It seems like they'll push them just past the prior high, and then they die, okay? So you want to wait till you get an entry. Once you get an entry, guess what? You could be a wrong. You could be wrong on any trade. I don't care who you are. Okay, even the guy screaming and hollering on TV, he could be wrong, or she could be wrong. On any given trade, so we put a stop in. If the trade works, we're going to on somewhat of a one for one basis. If it moves up, let's say it moves up fifty cents, we're going to bump our stop up fifty cents. Okay. It's going to be in somewhat lockstep manner. Now, tomorrow with the IPOs, I'm going to show you that we're going to be a little bit more liberal with the money management in general. We're going to treat them a little bit differently, but not too much differently than we do with the core methodology. But you want to trail that stop higher. And once you get your initial profit target, you're up to break even on the trade. Okay, You bump your stop to break even. You take off half, and then you keep half of your trade for hopefully it turns into a longer-term trend. Now, is half enough? Yes, because if it turns into a massive longer-term trend, you're going to make a lot of money even on half of the position. The people will argue way out here, okay, like this trend continues like this. People will argue way out here that half is not enough. You're only half on and you got a big old trend. Well, half is plenty, okay, because quite often you're not going to get this outlier move here. Quite often it might come right back in. Okay, so at least you took half your profits. At least you made something. I call that the better than the poke in the eye trade when it comes back in. Now, some people will say if the market's choppy and we're, we hit the profit target, comes back in, and we hit the profit target, comes back in, they state the obvious. Why did I take 100%? Well, if you take 100% of the profit target, and I've got a, a webinar out there that we talked just about that, you're going to end up with a negative expectancy, and that's where people think a lot of times that my money management has a negative expectancy. Because you're actually risking twice as much as you're making because you're only taking one for one on your stop. So if you're risking, let's say you're risking two, let's say you're risking, um, let's say five points, okay? Well, you're taking profits at five points. So you're only one for one on your initial profit target. But the way it works is you capture this additional, this occasional 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 or 100 to 1, some big number out here. That's going to make your entire year on just one position or one or two positions, okay? So, again, you want to wait for an entry, trail that stop higher, take partial profits, get that stop up to break even when you're taking the partial profits. And then once this, or if this, I should say, begins to materialize, you kind of relax, ha-ha, I know, and you let this stop widen out. Now, longer term, this stop is going to look like a very long-term moving average, and a lot of people ask me that when they first see me draw the stop in on a chart. They're like, is that a moving average? And I'm like, no, that's actually me eyeballing the chart and determining where my stop should be. Okay. So it all boils down to identifying a significant trend. I'm sorry, identifying a trend or a significant change in trend. Now, by change in trend, I mean a trend transition and emerging trend. And we're going to look at that 
in just one second. And then you want to enter that trend on a pullback. Money and position management are key. And then psychology is the ability to execute and follow that plan. Now let's look at this trend qualifying chart real quick. I've, I've talked about this chart forever. I beat it up quite a bit. The reason I like it is because you have a trend develops and all of a sudden it kind of dies out, which is exactly what we're going to see tomorrow quite a bit in the IPOs. At point A back here, we're just kind of going sideways. There's certainly no trend. Now we have a base breakout. Now with the core methodology, or you're trading, a, or if you want to look at it as trading an established issue out there, trading breakouts, although it worked in this particular case, is usually a bad idea. Tomorrow I'm going to show you some breakout characteristics that are worthwhile trading in IPOs. So you get a little base breakout, and then the stock begins to trend afterwards. You start getting a wide-range bar, meaning that the bars look like this, and all of a sudden you have a wide-range bar. And then they begin to close higher. Notice it closes towards the top of the range. You've got a little pullback here, and then the stock begins to take off again. You've got a gap here. You've got another gap here. You've got a strong close, meaning that it's closing towards the top of its range. So these things are telling you that a trend is developing or there's a trend in place, okay? And back here, this first pullback after a base breakout, that could be a pretty good pattern of trade. So you've got a market that's doing this, and then you get a breakout, that first little pullback. Don't enter here because more often than not, it'll come back into the base, okay? I probably should have drawn the base like this, okay? You'll, you'll see a lot of this. But as soon as you see this, once it clears that base decisively, then maybe look to get in on a pullback. Now notice towards the end of this trend, it gaps higher and it shoots even higher, okay? But by the end of the day, it closes poorly, meaning that the close of the chart is down towards the lows, okay? So that tells me that maybe this move has exhausted itself. I would never ever trade on a one or even a, a one bar pattern as a reversal type of pattern. Now, I'll show you some one bar patterns once you get them in a trend, okay, uh, like a TKO, which we'll look at in a second. But if you've got a market that's doing this and then you get a one bar pattern like that, well, we're looking for a reversion to the mean back the direction of the trend. But if you get a one bar pattern that looks like this, even if it closes poorly or whatever, that doesn't mean that that market has turned. Okay, you need further confirmation. In this particular case, that market lapped higher, lap mean, meaning a gap, but not above the prior day's high, and then it came back in and it closed poorly. Now, at this juncture, within the next day or so, we're like, wait a minute, this thing looks like it's a major reversal. The stock pulls back a little bit, triggers what I call a first thrust. We'll look at those in one second, and then begins to sell off. So you can see that the trend materialized, ran up for a little ways, oh, I don't know, 300%, and then began to implode. And by the way, this stock no longer exists. Now, another way, another thing that's good when it comes to trend is persistency. Mathematically, this is equivalent to linear regression. It's what's called a least squares method, oops, where you just... You can just draw a line through as many bars as you can, okay, through being the key word in that sentence. And, again, it's mathematically equivalent to linear regression. Don't get caught up in the math. Just draw your line through as many bars as you can. If it market tends to go up day after day after day after day after day, then that's a market that you want to be in, provided, of course, you get a setup and an entry, and you use a stop just in case. If it goes down day after day after day, it's a market that you might want to be shorting. Now, I'm not a big fan of indicators. I kind of view indicators as what I call illustrators. They illustrate what's already happening in the market. Remember that an indicator is a derivative of price. And then some people have derivatives, uh, derivatives of derivatives, meaning that they have indicators based on indicators. And I was guilty of that a long time ago, and I even did some Recursive indicators, which an indicator recurs on indicator recurs on indicator. That's how complex that I, I was making my life, oh, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 years ago when I was trying to figure it all out. It took me a long time to get rid of all that stuff. But view indicators as illustrators, meaning they illustrate what's already going on in the chart. Moving averages can be quite useful 
keep you on the right side of the market. Now, we're not going to find much use in a moving average tomorrow in a lot of the stocks because they're brand new and they don't have a history and no moving average. Now, all indicators have lag because they are a derivative of price. But the beauty of a moving average is sometimes it might begin to roll over or you might get a crossover. And if you're just looking at the chart, you might see like something like this in the chart, okay? And you might just you might be seeing that longer term trend that's just sticking out in your mind, that big arrow that I like to draw. But you might not notice that over more recent times it's sort of begun or has begun to slow down a little bit. So sometimes that moving average can alert you to that. So I always look at a blank chart first, and then occasionally I throw a moving average in. Okay, um, maybe a little bit more often, more often than occasionally, but I would say more often than not, I'm looking at a blank chart. But every now and then I'll throw a moving average in. Now there's two important concepts when it comes to moving average: slope and daylight. Okay. Daylight is simply the lows are greater than the, I'm sorry, lows are, yes, the low of the price bar is greater than the moving average. If you held it up to a, to a window with sunlight coming in, you'd have daylight, okay, in between the lows and the moving average. This is daylight here. And then the slope is just what direction is that moving average headed. Now, there's going to be lag, don't get me wrong, but the direction is important, and daylight's going to happen quickly, okay? Daylight means that you'll have daylight occur with no lag whatsoever because price will just pop up. So this is one aspect, and this is, um, this is why I love teaching because it's something I never really thought about. Daylight is a zero lag type of indica indication with an indicator, if that makes any sense. Now, slope will be a little quicker, a little slower to catch up, but notice that this moving average was flat back here, and then you began to get daylight, okay? You had three bars of daylight, so, aha, price is beginning to take off, and then later on we see, yep, that's confirmed by a positive slope in the moving average, okay? So let's take a look at our chart from earlier, and you can see that you had a little daylight above, but it never really did get past its prior highs, and you had a little daylight below, and it never really did get past its prior lows, and then when the stock begins to break out, you, you get a lot of daylight in here, okay? In fact, believe it or not, except for this one little what I call a kiss, this one little kiss of the moving average, your 10-day moving average, it stayed above, the low stayed above. You had daylight for the entire period. So that's a pretty impressive run. So just by following the slope of the moving averages, just by looking at the daylight, you could see that a very nice trend can be captured. By the way, if you're ever watching a presentation, and I don't want to pick on anyone too much, okay, but I've seen this happen quite a bit, where somebody will show you their system and they'll have like a buy and a sell and a buy and a sell and a buy and an exit and a buy and a sell, you know, over and over and over and over and over again. Look for something simple like daylight, okay, and say, well, if you'd have just bought where you had this daylight here, that would have kept you in that for a long, long time, especially if you're using like a 20-day exponential moving average. This trend began when the market broke out above this 20. We didn't know it at the time. We're followers. Wait for a little bit more confirmation. But you can see that it broke out above its 20-day EMA, and it stayed there for a long, long time. So if there's a moving average in the chart and somebody showed you their latest and greatest system, you know, don't be a jerk about it or whatever. Maybe talk to them on the side. But notice just, or don't even talk to them, but notice for your own amusement how something as simple as a moving average can keep you on the right side of the market. I did a wrote an article in 19, I think it was 1995 um, for stocks and commodities called a 220 EMA breakout system and you can find it on the internet. You can get it for about a buck fifty. I won't make any money on that so I'm not pimping it obviously but uh, it's, a, it's a cool little system back when I was doing some mechanical testing and it's based only on daylight and a moving average so you might want to check that out and keep it in your um, arsenal. Now usually I'll have a pop quiz at this point in time where I'll ask what this is and what this is and what this is, but I think by now you should know that's an uptrend, that's a downtrend, that's a sideways trend. So you should be able to draw a big arrow on the chart in the direction of the trend, if there is one, right? 
Uh, that's the back of my business card. If you want a business card, you could send me a self-addressed envelope to P.O. Box 298. And the town is a beta, which means, I think, life. And, and um, Italiano, Louisiana, and it's 70420. Okay? Now, there are three phases of trend that are tradable, I should say. There's trend resumption, where a market rallies, pullback. This is going to be a generic pullbacks. There's trend acceleration, where a market rallies, begins to take off, pulls back, and then takes off again. And then there's trend transition or emerging trends, where you have an uptrend, and it begins to fizzle out, and then a downtrend begins. Or you have a downtrend, it begins to sort of bottom out, and then an uptrend begins. Let's talk about trend resumption real quick. Now, two of my favorite patterns, other than generic pullbacks, are TKOs and persistent pullbacks when it comes to trading trends. So TKO, you're looking for this big arrow on the chart. You're looking for that. You're looking for this to be much higher than this, okay? You always need to ask, is the right side of the chart higher than the left? And if you find a broker that will let you trade off the left side of the chart, please give me a phone call, okay? One of you may get that. Uh, anyway, we're looking for a knockout move. Now, this move needs to be significant. It needs to take out at least two of the prior lows, and this should happen on a – wide range bar. It should happen on expansion of range. And what happens is you have all these happy little trend followers and all of a sudden, bam, and they get knocked out, or some of them at least get knocked out. And all of a sudden you get some eager shorts in here thinking that, oh, it's time has come. This company is stupid. They confuse the issue with facts. They confuse that piece of paper called the stock, or that little electronic blip now called the stock, with the actual company. Okay, or vice versa, however you want to look at it. So they're like, this company will never be profitable, will never cure cancer. It's got a PE of 100. They're making burritos, for goodness sakes. So they're going to rush out. When they see the little one-bar pattern, they're going to rush out and try to short that market. Well, guess what? If that market begins to rally, when that high gets taken out, those shorts are going to be hurt and pop. And anyone knocked out needs to think whether or not they want to get back in. The longs that are knocked out need to think whether or not they want to get back in. One way of knowing if the move was significant is if you get stopped out of the move. If your stops are properly placed at a fair amount away distance from the market, if you get knocked out, then you'll know that that was a pretty good good knockout move, right? That's one. That's at least my gauge because I know my stops are going to be fairly liberal. Now, I'll get stopped out, and so what? You know, I, it's a pick yourself up, dust yourself off, whatever Tosh and Jagger sang about years ago, and you start all over again. But, hey, you know what? I'll come back in after TKO. I got knocked out and say, man, that sucked. I actually dropped an F-bomb or two, truth be told. But then by the end of the day, I'm like, well, you know what? It looks like a TKO. So many times I'll come right back in after that knockout move and get back in here. Let's take a look at a, an example or two. Uh, this one's kind of cool because the trend is accelerating, as you can see, higher. Okay? And then it has a nice little knockout move here. And then it's a little bit of a slow start, but you can see the trend did take off afterwards. Okay? Um, this one's, could have, this one's almost on the cusp of being too extreme, and we're going to talk a lot about this one in a few more minutes. But what I liked about this one was you had this massive knockout move in this accelerating trend. And I didn't check the news, but when I see something like that, that tells me, especially the fact that it closed all the way back here, that tells me that there was some sort of news in this stock, and everybody rushed to the door at the same time to sell it. And then that selling exhausted itself, and people actually realized that, well, wait a minute, maybe this stock is still worthwhile. So that bad news got rinsed out of the system really quick. It took out a lot of players. It sucked in a lot of shorts really quick. And this is what happened afterwards in this particular setup. Now, this is the trailing stop here. We'll get to that in just a minute.
Now, a couple of notes on TKOs. It, it could be a very common pattern if you're just looking for a two-bar knockout. So if you set your scanning software to two-bar knockout, you're going to get a plethora of setups every day, and 99.9% .9 aren't going to be worth trading. Okay, So you want to make sure that that's an expansion of range, that people actually got knocked out of it, and you want to see the most strongest and persistent trends. So you want to make sure that the knockout move is meaningful and the trends are persistent. It could be a really good pattern doing a blow-off move. Sometimes you'll get a market, and it just starts accelerating higher, and then, bam, you get a TKO, and everybody and their brother thinks, that's it. That's it. The, the, these burritos are no good. You can't have a PE of 5,000 or 500, whatever it is. We're going to short the mess out of this stock. We're going to catch a top. And then what happens? You get a TKO triggers, and all of a sudden that stock goes straight up. Okay? So it can be really good to get you in that blow-off move. you got a blow-off move begins to unfold. Bam! You get the TKO, and then the market takes off once again. Now, persistent pullbacks, very, very, very simple pattern. Again, you're drawing that linear regression, but I just like to do it by drawing a line through as many bars as possible. And then you're looking for a pullback. The best pattern I like with this is like a TKO. You get a nice persistent move, then you get that TKO pattern, and then you look to enter when the trend or as the trend begins to resume. Okay? This is a bit of a dated example, but you can see that this market was in a very nice persistent uptrend, just went up day after day after day after day after day, and then you get a knockout move. If you're familiar with some of my other stuff, it kind of looks like a double top knockout where you have a, a top, and then you have some separation in between, then you have that second top, and then you have the knockout move. Call it a double top knockout, which, which sucks in even more people thinking that the market has topped. Okay? And uh, here's an example on the short side of a persistent. I'm sorry, that last one was a TKO, but it's also persistent. Notice how persistent this move was higher. Now, this is a little bit rarer on the short side because the short side normally does this, and then does this, and then does this. It's harder to trade on the short side than the long side. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't short. We are short a position right now, and it's been chopping around like a crazy thing. Okay, but but you should all you should play both sides of the market if you want to survive longer term. But the short side is a little tougher. And then you're going to find that these persistent pullbacks don't happen very often on the short side. But you can see when they do, they're pretty cool and they can work. And this actually made a persistent pullback, pullback, and then continue to persist lower. And that's even more rare for a short. Now, you're looking at this one and you're probably thinking, well, that's not the most persistent stock that I've ever seen. And you're right. But it's fairly persistent, given the fact that this is a this is a gold stock, okay? And gold could be choppy and efficient and chop around quite a bit. Uh, it, gold is efficient, I should say. It chops around quite a bit. So gold stocks following the unlined metal can be kind of choppy, and uh, and when it, when they do trend. But this is a fairly persistent trend. You could draw a trend line through most of the bars. And by the way, um, if you have Meta stock or Telechart you could do a linear regression trend line as I often show in the presentations and I do one by hand real quick and then I'll do one with the software and they're 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 pretty much in line with each other. And it's something fun to kind of play with. Like sometimes what I'll do or I have done in the past I should say is I'll draw like a five day linear regression, a ten day linear regression, a twenty or thirty or forty even longer. And what'll happen is you'll get a bunch of little lines on your chart showing you longer term trend, shorter term trend. And it's kind of fun to play around with. But, again, you got to be careful that you don't end up with the chart that we started off with at the beginning of the presentation. So I'll go from a blank chart to a linear regression chart uh, just for fun every now and then. But it's something to play with. So the good thing about uh, persistent pullbacks is they're self-regulating. You're going to get more in good conditions and fewer in bad conditions. So that's great for the beginning trader. Um, in 2008, when the market lost 50% uh, of its value, I don't remember. Now, somebody might prove me wrong, but I don't remember once that early into 2008, once that move got started. In fact, it actually got started in 2007. So I think it's safe to say 2008, 
there were no persistent pullbacks on the upside. There were no buy signals for the entire year of 2008. So that one pattern would have kept you out of the market alongside at least for the entire year. So that means that you'd have beat about 95% of all money managers just by following this one pattern. So it is self-regulating. It's a great place to start, and it's a great place to come back to. As I said earlier in this presentation, I know your eyes are going to glaze over. For those of you who already know the methodology, uh, when I go through all these basics, but sometimes you need to hear the basics. A stock is not the company, and a company is not the stock. Sometimes something simple like persistency. When you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator and you're not making any money and you're scratching your head and wondering why, and you can't figure out if you're in a third of a fifth or a fifth of a third when it comes to your count, then stop doing all that and look for some persistency in the chart. Look to draw an arrow on your chart. So come back to something simple. And if you if you got into a drawdown and you were, especially if you're following something more complex, then take a step back, look at what you're doing, and make sure you're not ignoring the basics and watching something like persistency. I think if you just had to trade one pattern, this would be it. Um, I would recommend anyone brand new to trading just to do this. So I know most of you here, I recognize all your names here, or for the most part, I'd say almost all of you. Um, if you do someone who wanted to trade, just uh, get the pattern off my website. I think it's somewhere on there, or just email me. I'll send it to you and say, look, this is just do this for a year and get good at doing this and become successful at this. It amazes me that if you're not successful with one pattern, what makes you think you're going to be successful with 10? But I digress. So, again, if you just trade one pattern, I think this would be it. And it's especially powerful when combined with persistency in the market and the representative sector. That doesn't happen very often. I've done a few columns, and a few being a key word in that sentence, over the years, where the overall market is set up as a persistent pullback, the sector is set up as a persistent pullback, and the stock is set up as a persistent pullback. So if you can get all three set up, then I'm not going to say load the boat, but I'm going to say that your chances of winning on that trade are probably pretty darn good. All right, let's talk a little bit about trend acceleration and accelerating momentum strategy. And what we're doing with this is we're looking for some sort of gradual trend. It's not necessarily a trend that we would trade, but we're looking for a market to improve. And then we're looking for the market to accelerate in the trend. Now, keep in mind, we don't sit here and, and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until something sets up. We start right here and look backwards and say, oh, okay, well, it's been nice gradual trend, bam, nice acceleration of trend. And then we look for a pullback afterwards, okay? And here's an example. This stock just kind of begins to kind of creep its way higher, work its way higher, looking pretty good in here. And then all of a sudden, notice that it began to accelerate higher, and you look to play that first pullback, okay? And getting back to the CLDX we talked about a lot earlier, notice that it's kind of had this longer-term gradual uptrend to it. Now, in this case, I will draw a trend line under the bars, but people get caught up in the drawing of the lines. And usually people, like, they'll ask me all these questions about drawing lines. And, and what I explain to people is that I mostly draw lines – for your benefit so you could see what I'm seeing. I could just eyeball this and see that this is a gradual trend higher. It might not be something I want to trade, but it's a gradual trend higher. And then here I could eyeball it and see, wow, it uh, looks like a nice little persistent trend. And not only is it persistent, but it's accelerating. It's going from here, bam, winning to here. And then I've got that knockout move, which I've enlarged for you here. Okay. So you can see a big old knockout move, but it's within a very sharp and accelerating uptrend. So that's accelerating momentum strategy. Now we're going to talk about emerging trends. And the first thrust is you have a market making a major low. And major being a key word in that sentence. 
the more major the low, the more people are going to be on the wrong side of the market. You're going to have a lot of people in here that are short a market when it's making ideally all-time lows. And then you get a thrust off those lows. Those shorts begin to get squeezed, and they're looking to get off the hook. And you enter after the first sign of a pullback. We're not waiting for a nice deep pullback. We're not waiting for a TKO or some sort of longer-term trend to be established. We're looking for a big thrust, a big pop off the lows, and then we're looking for a one bar, at least, pullback, and we're looking to get long above that. Your best setups are going to occur when you have just one little tiny bar, okay, and then the market, bam, is off to the races because the most people are going to be stuck on the wrong side of the market. If I haven't said it before, I, I, I know I've said it before, but if I haven't said it already today, Keep in mind, there's nothing magical about technical analysis, at least my approach. We're looking to read the emotions of the participants of the market, and we're looking for patterns to capitalize on those participants. With a first thrust at point one, we know in this longer-term trend that the most amount of people are going to be on the wrong side of the market when that trend turns, and they're going to be looking to get off the hook, okay? And they're not going to do it the first sign of adversity. They're going to wait until they have some pain. And then when you get that little bit, they start feeling pretty good right here when it starts coming back down like they're okay. Well, that's the best time to get in when that trend resumes after that. Okay. Now, this stock made an all-time low here. Notice that this was right at that all-time low, which is also a double bottom. Now, I don't trade off a double bottom in and of itself. I don't think you could use, and I don't want to. I don't want to get into any debates with anyone out there on on classical technical analysis. I'm a huge fan of te classical technical analysis. I've read all the books, obviously. I don't think you could trade off a classical technical analysis in and of itself, but I think you could certainly use it to back what you're doing and then wait for some pattern. So here we have a double bottom. I'm not going to buy because it's a double bottom. Why? Because it might turn into a triple bottom. It might even break through that and keep on going, okay? But when I see this thrust higher like this, and then even notice that this has kind of a micro version of what we talked about earlier, meaning that you have an acceleration of trend. If you look at it really closely, you can see that this trend actually accelerated here and then begins to pull back, okay? And that turned into the mother of all winners. I think we have it in another chart here in one second. On the short side, you're looking for just the opposite. You're looking for an all-time high, ideally, or a multi-year, or maybe a decade high, the longer the better. You're looking for a big thrust down. You're looking for at least a one-bar pullback, and you get in below the low of that pullback. Here's an example on the short side. You can see the market had a pretty serious thrust down. Notice that that thrust began with a gap. That's a trend qualifier. We talked about that earlier. Notice you got wide-range bars closing fairly poorly in here, and then you get a little bit of a pullback, okay? Now let's talk about bow ties. Now once again, price is the ultimate indicator. And an indicator which is derived from price does not predict. It just simply shows you or illustrates what's already there. Okay. So the moving average we're going to use are 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential. And we're looking for them to come together and spread out, kind of like a bow tie. Okay. And that's where I got the name, obviously. So we're looking for those moving averages to do that, where the 10 is less than the 20. So this would be less than the 20, and the 20 is less than the 30. And then here, the 10 is greater than the 20, and the 20 is greater than the 30. It's going to be a little bit more askew on a chart, if that's a word. It's not going to be perfect, but you can see that when the trend begins to turn, those moving averages will turn up and flip over, and ideally that will happen over three to four days, giving you what I call that fulcrum point in there. And that means that the most, um, that, that, that your, all your cycles are beginning to change, okay? I'm not a big fan of cycle analysis, but I know that cycles do occur. They occur everywhere. They occur in nature. They occur in life, okay? They occur in markets. And when you see those moving averages flip over, especially over three to four bars, especially when it makes a nice little tight fulcrum point like we have here, you know there's a pretty good chance that that trend has changed. And again, we're looking for like a one bar pullback, and we look to get in above that 
one bar pullback. Okay. Now, getting back to our prior example where we had the first thrust, it also made a bow tie. Okay. And we used a fairly liberal stop and initial profit target as we're going to do tomorrow with the IPOs because this is a fairly volatile stock and we're trying to I hate your word use the word try, but we're looking to capture a fairly major major bottom in this stock because it sure looks like it's bottomed out, okay? And it's set up and it's pulled back, it's a bow tie, it's a first thrust, it's accelerating, it's got all these things we look for. So we got a fairly wide stop in there because if it comes all the way back to that stop, then we know that we're wrong and it's not through bottoming. But if it does take off, we know that it has a potential to give us a pretty decent initial profit target and then hopefully beyond, okay? And this is up in the nearly 40s now, and that was a pretty good run from that. There was a discretionary call back here, by the way. We don't have enough time to get into discretion today, but... Um, it came down and it actually touched nine. That was a stop, what I call a stop, Nick. It's okay to use a little discretion. That's one thing we won't have much time to get into today. But occasionally you could use discretion in your positions. And that sometimes can make all the difference in the world. When you're looking at first thrust versus bow ties, keep in mind that a bow tie generally will catch a more gradual change in trend. Sometimes you get a bow tie in the market and go, well, goodness gracious, I thought that market was still an uptrend. But now I do see that's beginning to roll over. Sometimes, though, you'll have this sharp thrust down, and then you have a little bit of a pullback. Well, that's a first thrust. So look for a first thrust first. Right here, the moving averages haven't crossed over yet. Okay, so this first thrust triggers. These haven't crossed over yet. Now they crossed over right around here, okay, or here or wherever. And... By the time you get a setup, okay, no, here, I'm sorry. By the time you get a setup, these, this market may be way down here. So this is where the lag kicks in. The beauty of the moving average is when you have a market that makes a gradual rollover, okay? Uh, 2007 was kind of a gradual rollover, and people think, well, the top was in 2008. No, the top was in 2007, and you had a weekly, believe it or not, bow tie, in 2007. I don't have the weekly bow tie chart in here, but you're going to be pretty amazed. When you get a chance, go in and look at your weekly bow tie chart. And I've, I've shown it so many times, people are sick of seeing it, but you, you will see that your major bull market tops and ma major bear market bottoms all had these weekly bow ties in them. And it's kind of a fascinating pattern for that. Um, this is what I call a bit of a, a forced bow tie because it's, this is a first thrust setup, but the bow tie caught up with it really quick. But it is a bow tie off of all-time highs, okay? Again, if you're trading a more efficient market like gold or commodities or Forex, then look for all-time highs or look for all-time lows and look for a bow tie or some other transitional pattern, and I think you'll do just fine. But don't try to trade every little zig and zag and pullback and everything else in between, okay? All right, we got patterns, we got trend, we covered the three phases of trend. Any questions on any of that before we get into money management? Okay. Um, the basic money management is to risk only a small amount in any given trade, but be consistent. So if you're just starting out, it might be a quarter of a percent of your account on every trade. Once you get better at what you're doing and consistent, become consistent and profitable, then you could risk as much as 2% per trade. The only problem is you need to be consistent. Don't risk a quarter of percent on one trade and then 2% on another because what will happen is that one quarter percent you risk, that will turn into the mother of all winning trades. And then you'll take that 2% position, which is a big position, and, of course, it'll turn into a losing trade. So if you're inconsistent, even if you're occasionally right, and that's all you have to be is occasionally right, okay, you're going to not, you won't do very well. So you need to be consistent in your risk throughout. Um, keep in mind, if you get stopped out, you get stopped out, so be it. One big winner is going to cover numerous small losses. Now, the big winner seems pretty elusive, and it's like they just they just come around 
just often enough to make it worthwhile. Most people will give up on a trend-following methodology, and a lot of them, unfortunately, will go off to chase rainbows. But most will, when they start getting chewed up a little bit, like right now we're getting chewed up a little bit, admittedly, okay? It's not much fun. Well, this is the time where most people go off to chase rainbows. Just the opposite can sometimes happen, and just the opposite is the worst, uh, because at least when they're chasing rainbows, maybe they're making a little, losing a little, but just the opposite will happen is when they'll come in during a good cycle, and the market goes straight up, and they absolutely print money, and then things get a little choppy, and then they, figure, then they spend the rest of their life figuring out, trying to figure out what went wrong. So the, the bottom line is it's going to be good time and bad times, and if money management Money management will keep you in the game long enough for those good times. If you take uh, partial profits half when you risk, when your reward, it's, 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 yeah. start over on that. Take partial profits, that's half, when your reward equals your initial risk, okay? If the trend doesn't material, if the trend materializes, you're still in, okay? If it doesn't materialize, as I said earlier, boring overnight gaps, you have a better than a poke in the eye trade, okay? So let's say you enter a trade here. Your risk is down here. Well, if you take this amount and measure it up here, that's going to be your initial profit target, okay? And once that profit target is achieved, you make sure that stop gets bumped up to break even. In reality, you might notch it up each day as the market, but only if the market moves in your favor and as the market moves in your favor, okay? Now, the real money is in the trend following, and you have to learn how to change hats from that trader hat to that trend follower hat. If you just come in as a, a longer-term trend follower, you're going to look pretty good at times, but there's going to be other times when you might just get wiped out, okay? So that's why you have to be that short-term trader that's willing to change hats and go into a longer-term position. And again, you kind of bump this up lockstep early on in the process, and then as that position moves more and more in your favor, you let that stop widen out more and more, and you're changing hats from that trader to the trend follower, and hopefully you stay with that market for a long, long time. So back here where a trader stops fairly close, but as you can see, as that trend moves more and more in our favor, that stop begins to widen out. I was amazed that I've done this and shown this to many people people who are incredibly intelligent and they've, they've never seen this unfold in real markets uh, the way I do it. And and I just thought everybody, I thought it was like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. You know, everybody knows that. Well, evidently, everybody does not know that. So again, you let that stop widen out and you make that transition from the trader to the trend follower, okay? And here's just yet another example of that uh, the more the stock moves in your favor, the more room you can give it, and the better your chances of catching a longer-term trend. Because you're allowing that stop to widen out to a point where if that market does have a major correction and turns right back around and goes right back up, you'll be able to ride that out. Eventually, you will get stopped out, see things on a net-net basis, so it comes down and stops you out, and you made 200% on the trade from here to here, or whatever that is then be happy. Don't mentally monetize your open profit. So it's better to have loved and lost than to never loved at all. And I'll show you that on a chart in just one second. Um, allow the stops to widen naturally. So as the market goes up, you bring your stop up, but at a decelerated pace. You don't want to have a market go up and say, okay, well, I'm going to my stop was at, uh, let's say, 50 yesterday. I'm going to put it at 45 today. No, you don't want to do that. But your stop might be at 50 here. You might want to go to 51, and this might go from 50 to, let's say, 53, okay? So you let that widen out, what I call naturally, often by not doing anything, okay? Now, keep in mind, in markets, it's never enough. Now, some people will say, but Dave... If you look at maximum adverse excursion or maximum favorable excursion or whatever, you rarely get more than 200% of the trade. So what? So what? That rare time when it does occur, 
might pay for a lot, okay? So don't quit just because you're up 50% because statistically it's not going to go much more than 50%. Don't quit when you're at 100% because statistically it might not go much more than 100%, okay? Again, statistical worthless, okay? So in this particular case, this is one of my favorite little charts, and this is that CLDX example we're kind of beating the dead horse on. But I love the fact that you're up 25%, then 4%, then 44%, then 25%. You could see you took some fairly serious wax along the way, but if you just looked at this chart, you could see it pretty much went up, but in between, you had some drawdowns to those open profits. And in this particular case, I don't know if we had profit taken there or not just yet, but you can't quit, okay? So don't quit at the 50. Uh, that's like... Um, football analogy so this is the this is the football field this is the 50 yard line if you quit at the 50 you're never going to score right so be willing to give up some of those open profits okay uh, you want to widen until the stop begins to hurt a little bit where would I be really really wrong once you're in that long term trend not right away but as that trend moves more and more in your favor over a, a period of time Again, let that stop kind of widen out, okay? So if this market came all the way back down and stopped you out there, obviously the trend has probably changed, okay? Now, if you do it properly, sometimes the market will come up, base, come up, base, come up, base, rinse, and repeat. So if it's done properly, what will happen is you'll find that stop will end up below that base and then come up below that base and then come up and it'll be that below that base again. So sometimes that'll happen. And remember, it's better to have loved and lost some open profits than to never loved at all. Now, this is our example that was up over 200% here. Hey, we got stopped out for 153%. So what? Better than a poke in the eye, right? If you made 153% in every one of your trades, you would own the world very fast okay so don't worry about how much you give up don't monetize this open game we're going to talk a lot about that tomorrow because you are going to have to you are going to have to give these IPOs some room to breathe and you might be up a tremendous amount and you're going to have to give up a little bit of that tremendous amount but you have to look at things on a net net basis okay and not monetize that open profit okay again we'll get in, we'll get into this a lot more tomorrow um, pay attention to increasing volatility. If what you are doing, you're doing right, then you're going to have that volatility take off along with the price. And we'll take a look at that. And hopefully the characteristics of what you're doing, your characteristics change. Your kitty becomes a tiger, hopefully. So you get into a market, and what you want to have happen is you want to be in that market, you want to have that trend accelerate, and you want the volatility to accelerate too, okay? So the, the nature of this market back here, even though it's fairly volatile, has quickly changed over a period of a couple of weeks. So you're adjusting accordingly with that stop and letting that stop widen now. out. Now, a lot of times you don't have to do anything. I play little games, and one of the games I play is called Keep the Change. So let's say you're trading a higher price or someone higher price stock. Let's say it's $30 a share. And you've got a nice little profit in that stock, and you're already taking partial profits. And it goes up $0.37. Cents, okay, I don't know why I picked that, but for some reason, $0.37. Cents. Well, if you don't do anything, your stop is going to widen by that amount. Okay, So the market's now here. So now you have this plus this. So your stop just kind of widens out a little bit. Now, if you keep chip it along like that, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Then you can start gradually bumping your stop up again. But sometimes it's like, why bother if it just goes up a little bit and that plane to keep the change when it keeps moving more and more in your favor. And one thing you have to see when you are raising that stop is see yourself as gaining ground. So let's say the smart goes up three points. Well, you might just bring your stop up two points, okay? Don't think about that one extra point you're going to lose when you get stopped down on this. Think of it as gaining ground, okay? Now, barring overnight gaps, 
Okay, market went up three points. Well, you gained at least two points on that, and maybe even more because you're letting that widen out. Okay, and maybe that longer term trend will materialize. A um, couple of random thoughts on profits. You need to treat open profits differently, okay? And that's one thing that did come out of uh, Curtis Faith's book, The Way of the Turtle. I'm not a big fan of that longer-term trend following because I think that you need to take more of a hybrid approach like we've been talking about all day today. But do read that book. And uh, I like the way I think it was Dennis and Eckert, I forget, well, I think it was Dennis, talked about open profits differently, meaning that, don't monetize those open profits. Don't say I could I could buy a car with that or I could buy whatever. Um, let them go. Let them run because you don't know how far they're going to go. Whereas if you have a loss on a trade, you need to be willing to cut that short. With the open profits, let them run and, again, be willing to give up some of that. Don't worry about dead money. If you make that chart I just showed you, that went up 150 something, went up 200 percent, and then you got stopped at 100 percent. Well, if you look somewhere in between, it did that for a little while, and then it did that again. Okay, a lot of people see this as dead money. Well, there's no way to know that it's, it's dead money until after the fact. So forget about that. Don't have a performance anxiety uh, pushed on you. I know that's hard. I know um, we have at least one person in here that's with a money management firm. I imagine that there's performance anxiety on you. It's one of those things, so, but you got to try not to let that get to you, especially when you have on your private trader hat where you could do whatever you want, okay? And that's the advantage, again, in the IPOs. We could do what we want. We're not uh, – sometimes I'll recommend a, a good-looking stock like one of those earlier that took off, and I'll have an RIA in the group, and uh, he can't take the trade because it's, it's the volatility is too extreme or whatever. But as a private trader, we do have some certain advantages – when it comes to certain issues. And again, we'll get into all that tomorrow. Uh, once you have a tiger by the tail, give him some room to breathe, okay? Major trends can often have major corrections, okay? You want a baby? You better get ready to deal with some baby poop. This was, uh, I was at uh, the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts uh, speech, and uh, one of the speakers got up and he was talking about um, he was talking about relative strength, and, and the way he talked about it, momentum, trend, it's all the same, relative strength. Uh, if you want to have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. If you want to trade momentum, you're going to have to deal with these sharp retraces. And um, his name escapes me at this, at this moment. I'll have to think about it. But he was with uh, Dorsey and Wright for a long time. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm, I apologize for not having his name. Um, if you're getting stopped out a lot, your stops are probably too tight. Or your stock selection could be a lot better. Somebody, this has happened on more than one occasion. I've gotten emails, and somewhere for somebody like 20 sticks to mind. I remember one guy was 21. I think one guy was 19. So somewhere around 20, uh, these gentlemen have been stopped out like 20 times in a row. So they're either doing one or two things wrong, or some combination thereof. One, their stops are probably too tight, or two, their stock selection could be a little bit better. Okay. Now I've fixed a lot of people. I was just talking about this yesterday in the webinar. A lot of people call me up, Dave. I can't. I'm not profitable. And it's like a lot of times I look at the trades and say, you know, just loosen up your stops a little bit, and you begin to catch more and more trends. The looser your stop within reason, the more trends you're going to catch. You just got to catch a few of them. Okay. Now, the two things they're doing wrong: one, the stops might be too tight, or two. The stock selection could be a little bit better. So defense is important. And I spent a lot of time talking about defense today and the importance of money management. But sometimes your best defense is a good offense. So you want to ferret out that stock that might go up 50%, 100%, 200%, 300%, 300 or more. You want to make sure you have persistency or acceleration or some combination thereof and gaps and laps and direction of the trend. A strong closes and then uh, a setup. You want all of those things. Now, I spent 14 hours plus an additional, I think it was eight hours, so it's 20-something hours total on stock selection. I'm going to, do, I'm going to cover, we could get that all into like uh, five minutes here, okay? 
So keep in mind, there's a little bit more to it than this, but if you look at a lot of charts after a while, you begin to recognize these patterns, and you'll learn what cleanly means, okay? Stocks trades cleanly, okay? So you want them to look like this. You want them to be persistent, okay, in their trends. You want to be able to draw that big blue arrow. I say blue because my pay program defaults to blue. Okay, bad is electrocardiogram. And I put an actual electrocardiogram in here, but I get charts that look like this all the time. And I, I recognize a few names in here uh, from the weekly shows. And you guys come to the weekly shows, you'll see you'll see people will pull up. They'll ask me to. I, I don't know if they're, they're just yanking my chain or what, but they'll pull up stocks that look like electrocardiogram. They'll want me to uh, have an opinion on that or opine on that. And it's something that you don't want to do. It should be pretty obvious. The market should be making a pretty serious trend or uh, an emerging trend if you're going to trade it. Ideally, you want to see acceleration of trade like we talked about earlier, okay, and not a deceleration in trade. And what happens is a lot of people, excuse me, excuse me, um, had sneeze. A lot of people will see this market here and they'll see this market here and they'll connect the dots and yep they're right to draw that big blue arrow okay don't get me wrong they're right but what they fail to see is that the trend has begun to decelerate okay and you'd be surprised how many stocks you could avoid by staying out of markets that are decelerating there's no guarantee that the market won't keep going higher, even if it's decelerating. But that's where you have to say, so what? I know that this deceleration could be worse. It could turn into that. So you want to make sure you have an acceleration of trend. Overhead supply is really bad. Now, the good news is with the IPOs, there are no bad memories. There are some people that are looking to get off the hook, and we'll talk a lot about those tomorrow. A lot of that's academic, okay? So we don't have to worry about it too much, but there's no visible overhead supply with an IPO. But if there's a lot of trading within a range and a market drops below that range, and again, I use the, stock, uh, the word stock and market interchangeably because it's, it's all human nature. When that market gets back up to that range, people will be looking to get out of break even. I've had people call me before who are friends and relatives and say they want to buy a stock, and I'm like, don't buy it because the most you're going to get is a buck because it's at 19 now and at 20 you got a bunch of resistance. So, oh, well, I bought it up in there, you know. So people buy stocks and then they call me later. I, I know how it works. Nobody wants to get educated. Except for you guys and girls, okay. Um, to catch short-term and longer-term trends, again, you got to pick the best and leave the rest. I know it's cliche. But there's a lot of motivated individuals. I see a doctor in here. I see a fund manager um, and some other people. So you're all highly motivated, highly educated people, and you want the best in life. And for some reason, you tend to look for the best in everything. And that's a good thing. And that, you know, nobody wants to be around somebody that's malignant, okay? We all know those people, those kind of people. We want to be somebody, We want to be around fun people, positive people. But unfortunately, that the same things that make you successful in real life can hinder you a little bit when it comes to markets. And you might try to make something happen where there's nothing actually there in the markets. You might try to see a pattern when there's nothing actually there, when it's actually electrocardiogram. Whereas you look for the best in life, for some reason, you don't look for the best in the patterns. And... Maybe that comes with time, but just uh, take your time and pick the best and leave the rest. Let things unfold. Sometimes big move takes time to develop. And then loosen those stops. And often by doing nothing, once again, or not doing anything, I guess would be proper English, that stock goes higher, that market goes higher, and your stop begins to widen out. Play the little keep the change game. Um, this is one of probably the best advice. It's, it's one of the best things I think I've ever said. I've been quoted repeatedly on this and I'm very proud of that it's a uh, obsessed before you get into a trade and not afterwards okay uh, I get emails all day long what do I do what do I do what do I do with XYZ well what's your plan what did you plan to do what where did you get in what was your plan when you got in 
And we talked about this a lot yesterday, so I don't want to beat the dead horse on that. The video is on my website. But you want to really think about what you're going to do with that trade before you get in. And you have all the known knowledge. You know everything about that stock from a technical analysis standpoint going in. Once you get into that stock, things can change quickly. You have zero control over what happens other than you honor your stop, you take partial profits when it hits that profit target, and then you trail that stop higher and loosen it up as time passes a little bit and as your profits increase in order to capture a longer-term trend. I know, it's easier said than done. And that's why we've now come to the toughest part of trading. And that would be you, trading psychology. I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Now, after I publicly said that, one guy comes running up to me after a seminar in Dallas, I believe, and tells me he's not successful. But he just started trading. So when I made that statement, I met someone who's been trading for a period of time, or I should say studying trading for a period of time. So I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader who has actually studied the markets. And you start paper trading, you start doing pretty good. Once you put money on the line, things begin to change really quick. Uh, the market's the world's worst teacher. If we get into a prolonged, choppy market, I'm going to get a bunch of emails from people that tell me that selling options is the way to go and how much money they made selling options, okay? I've never had anyone, so far at least, come to me after a choppy market who sold a lot of options. I've never had them tell me in year two or year three that they've continued to sell options and they're still in business, okay? Now, maybe somebody's out there doing it, and God bless them. But the market is the worst teacher. It'll teach you to do some bad things. It'll lull you into a false sense of security. Let's say you use a stop, okay? You put a stop at 10. Market's at, I don't know, 13 or whatever. Comes down, stops you out, and then what happens? It turns around and goes straight back up. So you know what you say? You know what? Next time I'm not using a stop, okay? So it's at 13. It was 12, 11, 10, that's where your stop should have been. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So you got to be careful and not let the market teach you or lull you into doing the wrong thing. Now, it's a business filled with paradoxes. Sometimes the harder you try, the less the market accommodates. We all are motivated individuals in here. I know you are because you're paying for education, okay? Most people don't. Most people are lazy, okay? So kudos to you for taking your time out on your busy day to be here, and hopefully you learned a little bit, and hopefully you learn a lot tomorrow. So you're motivated individuals. That's easy to say. Well, motivated individuals don't become motivated and successful by not doing anything, but sometimes in the markets, you got to sit on your hands, okay? And sometimes it seems like the harder you try, it's just like, uh, what's the old adage, like if you're wrestling with an alligator or an alligator is eating you, you know, the more you the more you try to get away, the more you eat you or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's a, it, that's a bad analogy, I guess, because we don't want to experiment with an alligator, obviously, although I do occasionally hear one in a neighborhood. <laughs> um, but I digress. You don't want to dig yourself in a hole by trying to do more and more. Sometimes the best thing to do is just back off and not do anything. And sometimes when you're not doing anything, the market just, you just print money, okay? Your existing position is just, take off. So sometimes the less you do, the more you make and vice versa. Logic does not often apply. When I was putting the book together and somebody told me that Elder or somebody else came to the same conclusion, so um, that's fine. I, I think that we're all studying the same thing, so it makes sense that we came to the same conclusions. But I was trying to figure out a way to talk about buddy management. Um, and when I say the book, I'm talking about layman's, layman's guy, the trading stocks. Um, and I'm sorry, trade psychology. There were three M's. I, I, I put all my thoughts on a whiteboard, and then I begin to organize them. And I noticed that some fall under money management, some fall under the methodology, and then some fall under mind. Okay. I'm amazed at how much, you know, how important 
money management is when it comes to trading psychology. Money management will cure a multitude of sins, okay? It makes it a lot easier for you to follow your plan. If on any given trade, it's not going to have a material impact on your life, so what? You follow your plan, okay? Um, it allows you to view a loss as a cost. It's a business expense. I'm running a business here. I got to buy a new computer. Eh, so what? I bought a new one earlier this year. I need to buy another one. I don't feel like shelling out the money. I don't want to shell out the money, but it's not that big of a deal. It's a business expense. Eh, who cares, right? Um, it'll keep you in the game. Longevity is key. And that's the problem that I see repeatedly, okay, is that people don't stay in the game long enough. They get a few losses and they quit, especially if they're betting too big, okay, and then they quit. And then what happens? A nice trend comes along shortly thereafter. We talked about this yesterday. Douglas in a tape that I have here. Yes, a cassette tape, believe it or not, from a tag conference. So it's probably, that means it's 20, it's probably 25 years old. Um, he said that a good salesman, well, bad salesman, I should say first, will make a couple sales calls, get a few rejections, and then go drink his lunch. But a good salesman will make a few sales calls, get a few rejections, go grab a big cup of coffee, and sit down and say, all right, next. Because I know once I get a few of those bad calls out the way, statistically, I'm due for some good calls. I'm due to make some money from my calls. And that's the same thing that happens in the markets. When people get beat up a little bit, like we have been getting beat up a little bit lately, they quit. And then what happens? They miss these big winners that I just showed you as they come along. So every methodology has its nuances. Make sure you learn them. Okay, I know I picked on. I said I wasn't going to pick on some methodologies, but I did pick on some methodologies that I think you should avoid, such as selling options. Okay, because it it looks great on paper until you blow up. Do you realize that you could actually blow up doing that? Uh, my stuff is not perfect. Trust me, no methods are. The sweet spots can be brief. You have to be present to win. And that's something that sort of um, can be tough with some people. I mean, that's why I do a trading service for those people who want to follow the methodology and actually go off and have a life, too. Uh, not that I don't have a life, but I have a, a life with a laptop, okay? <laughs> um because you don't know when that next trend is going to come along. You don't know where it's going to be. And that could even happen in the middle of summer. Uh, the markets must trend, and that's a big duh on that. Chopping markets will chew you up, at least initially. Sharp reversals will whack you. Uh, but the good news is, eventually, if the market keeps chopping along, you get stopped out of everything. That drawdown becomes mitigated, and then you just wait it out. You wait for that next new trend to occur and then you look to get aboard. Uh, it can be a little skewed. The majority of the gains come from the minority of positions. Okay, So you definitely want to take the best of the best setups, but you've got to take enough setups to where you're going to capture the occasional home run. Now, for instance, the example I always give, like I'll have a pretty good period of the service, okay, and we're you know, for all intents and purposes, pretty much printing money. And I'll have a client quit. It's like, well, okay, well, why do you quit? So I can figure out what I'm doing wrong. How can I do better? What am I doing here? That's right or wrong. And they'll say, well, I didn't make any money. I'm like, you didn't make any money. This is the best. I'm not any better than, I can't do any better than this. And I'll say, did you get this one? They say, no. Did you get this one? They'll say, no. And then they've got, they took, I should say, the next four trades, which were losers, those two or one or two big winners would have paid for their entire year, but they didn't take them. They took those four losing trades, okay? So that's the skewed part. It can be a little tough, and I haven't solved for this, and I might never solve for some of these nuances of the methodology, and that's where you have to embrace those nuances and live with them. That's the baby poop that comes along with this, okay? Uh, that's where you have to deal with that baby, okay? You, you, you want a baby, you're going to have baby poop, and you have to deal with that. And that's just one of those things. And it is 
what it is. Okay. Uh, Michael Moody was who said the um, talked about the baby poop. By by the way, and he was talking about with momentum you're going to have these. Uh, when the momentum ends, it ends badly quite often. So that's with his methodology using the realist strength methodology. A lot of those same things kind of dovetail into into my methodology because we are trading trend. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the mind. It's either you or the market. Well, if you're trading during less than ideal conditions, if you're trading mediocre setups, then guess what? It's you. Okay. But the point I'm trying to make here, not to beat you up too much, is that sometimes it is a market. It sometimes, to put it mildly, it just sucks, okay? But you don't want to trade in less than ideal conditions, okay? You're going to be wrong a lot, get used to it. Doctors and lawyers in here, especially engineers and doctors, I should say, smart people, you're not used to being wrong a lot. If half your bridges fell down, Half your patients died, or I don't know statistics for lawyers, but I would guess that you probably would have to get most of your clients off the hook, or at least half, okay? But you're going to be wrong a lot, so you have to get used to it. Uh, most of hell is self-created. I did a whole presentation on doing the wrong thing, even though you know you're not supposed to do it. I wrote an article about it in Traders Magazine, so check that out if you get a chance. It's free. It's on the Internet. Um, your job is to read the charts to understand the psychology of the masses, but at the same time resist acting upon your own personal fear. Agreed. And that's not an easy task. Okay. Livermore said it the best. You know what you're doing wrong. A stock sp speculator, easy for me to say, sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. Okay. So think back to this. I know we covered a lot of little basics here today, but think back to this. Sometimes you'll be trading. And you know you're doing the wrong thing, but you'll do it anyway, okay? So be careful of that. Be cognizant of when that happens. Now, you have to, it all boils down to making decisions and living with them. And this is where I make a joke at my wife's expense. She knows it. She saw the book. It's in the book. Marrying the most beautiful woman that I ever met. That was a pretty easy decision, okay? Eh, living with her, it's not so easy. So just remember that when you are making those decisions, you're going to have to live with that decision. And that's the bit of the tough part. But the good part of that is once you make that decision, your trailing stop and your protective stop will either keep you in that position or take you out of that position. Uh, a big problem that I see when it comes to the emotions is micromanagement. I think a lot of novices think that pros know exactly when to get in, exactly when to get out, that we get out at the first signs of adversity, okay? After all, trading is an active verb. And that's not true. We don't know. And I just spent a lot of time telling you we don't know. I probably spend too much time telling everybody that I don't know, okay? I'd probably be... I probably would make a lot more money on the educational side of my business if I told everybody I knew everything, like some of these other people out there. But that's not how I roll, okay? I, I speak the truth, okay? There will be losses, okay? There will be adversity. And we don't know. And that's why you have to be willing to take a little heat. That's why you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits because we don't know where that top is, okay? And you have to be patient and follow your plan. A lot of people like, okay, I've got a plan. I'm going to get in at 10. I'm going to take profits at 12. I'm going to trail the stop up two points. That's what I'm going to do. All right, there's 10. Bam, they enter the trade. Okay. So 10 minutes later, the stock's at $9.50. They're down 50 cents already in the trade, 10 minutes into the trade. Okay. Their stop's at 8. They're down 50 cents. What do they do? They exit the trade. Well, what happens tomorrow? Gaps open five points and goes 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. They just watch the stock go straight up in anguish. So plan that trade and trade that plan. Make that decision and live with it. Be patient, okay? Plan your trade and trade your plan. And you can get this off my website. You can download the PDF 
from this. This is just a little um, some tr uh, planning, and this is straight out of Layman's Guide too. You can make a copy of that. You have my permission to make a copy of that uh, page. Uh, my methodology. This is where I temper your expectations. Again, it's not the only way to trade. It's the best I've found after many years of searching. I've been through a lot. I've been through the ringer. Trust me on this. Um, if you have my approach, again, use some of my stuff to make your stuff better. If you do the trading or switching methodology, just take your time and ease into things. Trade at a small size. Trade only one pattern at a time until you're successful. And then start slowly and build. And, of course, I'm here. You can always email me. Keep in mind, if you email me, I'm going to probably put you to work and give you a lot of homework. So be ready to work. But I will answer all questions. Um, what else are we missing? Well, there's a few more patterns. Uh, we did cover bow ties, but there's a reversal gap strategies. Uh, we covered first thrusts, gatekeepers. There's quite a few other patterns. Stock selection, we just kind of touched upon. That's a biggie. Discretion is a biggie, too, okay? Uh, getting it a little bit higher on certain entries, maybe even getting it early in certain market conditions. Sticking with a stop nick when that stop just comes down, barely touches your stock comes down and barely touches a stop and then takes off again. Um, there's a few more things uh, with money management, although I think we did a pretty good job of covering that. And then obviously there's a little bit more with psychology, but I think we did a pretty good job of touching upon that uh, today. Okay. All right. Any questions? We've got a quiet bunch today. I, I guess I'm preaching to the choir, which, is, which I guess is flattering to me. Um, any questions? Okay, I'll give it another minute or so. Usually what happens is I ask for questions, nobody says anything, I want to go to shut down. Well, while we're at an impasse, um, obviously I want to thank everybody again. Um, shoot me an email if you have any questions about the webinar or anything. Again, same sort of um, logistics tomorrow, except we're going to uh, change sessions about once an hour and check the schedule that, um, that's been sent. Okay, no questions? Going once, going twice? Okay. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's my wife. Yeah, I'm a lucky guy. At least, at least I, at least I think so. So, uh, yeah. See, it was pretty easy. Huh? Pretty easy to make that decision, right? <laughs> yeah, she's a pretty girl. Okay. Any other uh, questions? All right. Well, again, I can't thank you guys enough. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here um, and giving up your hard-earned cash to pay for the webinar, too. So thank you so much for that. I'm flattered, and I think you're going to really enjoy tomorrow. I am very much looking forward to it. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and then tomorrow you're going to see why. Uh, everybody have a great day, and then um, we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. Eat your Wheaties because I talk really fast. <laughs> thank you so much.